That's tonight on Dateline. It was a story about more than three decades. Dateline NBC has captivated the nation's attention with real life mysteries. You just watch Dateline before us here on the news at 10. And when you turn on the TV or surf the Internet, it seems there is an endless stream of true crime programs. The murders, abductions and mysteries all based on true stories. But why are we so drawn to this genre? For many, that fascination is turning into a growing obsession. But is it healthy? Tonight, we're taking a look at the science behind the fascination and the impact it's having on society. It's America's most heartbreaking mystery. My wife, she had an accident. What kind of accident? She, she fell down the stairs. Honestly, Lori and Charles looked like they had the ideal marriage. Either I'm a psychopath in sheep's clothing. They're the stories that first grip the nation in the headlines. The university has canceled all classes. Real life stories. Ethan and Zana, who are on the second floor, might have been in the way. Real life mysteries and real people. They're the wondrous Stacy and Sarah. They are both right now in custody. From the podcast to the documentaries, experts like clinical psychologist and boarded neuropsychologist Dr. Craig Beaver says there are a lot of things contributing to society's interest in true crime. He says as humans, we have a strong interest in what's happening around us and a strong innate need to be a really good observer. Kind of a little bit of a voyeur about everything going on around, okay? And we do that because part of our survival is we think if we can predict when and if bad things would happen, then we can engage in behavior that gives us a better survival. And then you add to this with true crimes, for example, is there's that little bit of excitement like seeing something that was bad and exciting and kind of intriguing. He adds this fascination is nothing new just maybe more accessible. For example, going back into the, say, the 17, 1800s, you know, we have examples where, for example, there's been a serial killer. And, you know, people got fascinated by it. It was written up in the, you know, the written communications of the time uh, where people got hooked on it. And it's still the same dynamics. Those dynamics can be witnessed in film, television, the internet, and podcasts. You could argue that Poe, Edgar Allan Poe, was writing some version of true crime back in the early 1800s. Dr. John Mathias is a licensed clinical and forensic psychologist in Las Vegas. I sometimes say that a better understanding of crime is a better understanding of ourselves. He also co-hosts Hidden, a true crime podcast and YouTube channel with his wife, Lauren, a journalist and former reporter. So on our first date, we discussed crime. They combined their backgrounds and started a conversation centered on one of their favorite topics, crime. We set up two microphones one night that we had purchased on Amazon at our dinner table. He said, let's just record our dinner table conversations. We were covering the Daybell case. Fast forward to now, and they have more than 51,000 subscribers on YouTube and 200,000 monthly podcast listeners. They say at the most basic level, society's obsession with true crime can be linked to the Sherlock Holmes theory. And that is that when a crime occurs, the world is upended. I think as humans, we, we want to solve mysteries. So we put on our Sherlock Holmes caps and try to figure things out and try to make sense of the world. And we've seen that notion play out on social media. Some people truly are interested in what's going on, what's happening. They want to know the details. They want to help in some way, shape or form. I think there's another side of it, too, where some people just really enjoy the drama that goes along with cases like this. Brooke Curtis is the owner and admin of the Michael Vaughn Fruitland Missing Child Search Facebook page. She says she started the page to support Michael's family and provide a place where only facts are posted. The page has 51,000 members from all over the world. Brooke, along with 12 others, check comments and posts daily to keep the page free of speculation from so-called Internet sleuths. They're searching through Google and whatever else, and they're trying to make two points meet that don't actually meet. In some instances, these sleuths can be helpful and detect things that may go unnoticed. But in other ways, they can be hurtful spreading misinformation and ruining people's reputation along the way. Something seen multiple times during the investigation into the murders of four University of Idaho students in Moscow. I think a lot of the sleuths out there 
want to put their blinders on and believe that they're just enjoying themselves at their computer, trying to solve a crime and not think about the people that they're hurting through their comments and questions on the other side. Criminologist and lecturer at Boise State University, Mark Rufinango. Initially, there's a, a lack of information, you know, and um, people maybe get frustrated by that lack of information because they don't have a lot of familiarity with the criminal justice system, and maybe they don't understand why um, the police are not sharing everything they know right away, and that there are many good reasons for not putting all your cards out on the table on the first day of an investigation, essentially. There's a great power in social media and online presentation. I think that when you when you put a child's face out there in the or a vehicle's been stolen and that post gets shared hundreds of times across social media, it can be a fantastic tool in this day and age. But when it comes to true crime, it's also easy to forget these are real people. It becomes like another TV show, which they disconnect. And I think in some cases, people forget when they are on the internet that there is a live family, um, a live mother and father and grandfather and grandmother sitting on the other end of what they are saying. And you're cutting them to their core when you're passing information. Parrot Analytics found the number of original streaming documentaries increased about 77% between January of 2019 and January of 2022, while U.S. demand shot up nearly 186%. How are you, Bubba? I'm not good, Mom. But I think people are really experiencing documentaries kind of like they never have before. Sky Borgman directs and produces documentary films, most recently Sins of Our Mother, the Netflix documentary about Lori Vallow. Belief really will take you to a different place. And it's just so confounding that a mother could potentially have murdered her two children, could have disappeared with them, um, could have you know gone onto this very sort of fringe element of religion. And it's so hard to understand that it's it's really about trying to find those answers and digging a little bit deeper into it. And so I think that's what's the most fascinating to me about watching these stories. And I think that probably plays into everybody else who watches them. But at what point does too much true crime become unhealthy? If you oversaturate it, it normalizes it in some ways for people. And that's a bad thing. I don't know that that always happens, but it certainly could happen. Dr. Beaver has witnessed patients in the past who have become so entangled in true crimes that it begins to impact their mental health, which can lead to nightmares or compulsively looking for information about a case. And I've seen that with some other people that have really challenges sometimes with their own boundaries and they start blurring them and they lose themselves in some of the characters or the victims. He says if you know someone dealing with this, get help and talk with someone. Anybody can have a YouTube channel. Anybody can have a podcast. And I think that people should be um, maybe a little careful about what they're listening to. And Mark also talked about how on TV shows like Law & Order, the person behind the crime is always caught, but in reality, the opposite is true. He says the police usually do not catch the person who commits the crime. In fact, he says most crime is unsolved and a lot of crime is actually unknown to police. And so what people see on TV is giving them false expectations about how criminal justice is supposed to work.